All right, so once again, uh, welcome to everyone who just joined us now. We are on our session three and uh, of uh, our masterclass introduction to fundamentals of blockchain and crypto assets, right? So today we're gonna to talk about um, decentralized finance and we're gonna talk about smart contracts, right? The reason why we cannot talk about uh, DeFi without talking about smart contracts because this is exactly what enables blockchain to be able to, um, you know, to have for us to have, you know, transactions, right? Uh, or decentralized finance. So as I said yesterday, um, money is a is a is a base layer, but then on top of that, we build all these other, you know, financial transactions, right? Whether it's going to be a real estate bond transaction, whether it's going to be um uh, like a, an equity fund whether it's going to be uh you know stocks so everything is built upon this foundation layer or base layer that is called money now the more high up we go into the ladder of all these financial instruments of course it becomes a little bit more high risk right so it's the same thing with uh, with, with the cryptocurrencies at the bottom we've got bitcoin and then on top of bitcoin uh, in fact, we've, we've got Bitcoin and then we've got the blockchain. So you find that with each and every one of these ecosystems, there is a base layer. For example, in Ethereum, you know, Ether is a base layer, but then there's all these other layer tools um, and all these other dApps that are built on top of that with their own tokens and so forth, right? So, <clears throat> so but then the more you go higher up in all these other dApps, layer twos, layer threes, um, it does get a little bit risky. Uh, even as far as, uh, you know, technical security is concerned, right, it does get risky the more you build on top of that. Uh, one of the things about the Bitcoin blockchain, it's built so simple that it is what makes it secure is its simplicity, right? Um, it has a, a little functionality in it. Um, that is why it is so robust and it is so secure. But then all this other blockchain, there's so many moving parts. That is why... In terms of safety, Bitcoin is number one, right? And then you've got others as well. Now, the more decentralized the, the blockchain with its node validators and node operators, um, you know, is the more uh, safe it actually does become, right? So, so let's talk about, let's talk about um, DeFi. So what is DeFi? So decent, DeFi is simply decentralized finance, right? Um, it's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's one of the sectors in the blockchain space that simply speaks about every financial instrument you can think of in the world right now is actually being built on decentralized finance, right? Where, um, in decentralized finance, um, there's quite a lot of benefits as compared to centralized finance. I'll give you one example. If you want to make a loan right now, uh, in South Africa, we've got what is called the National Credit Act. Um, you need to have a proof of address. You need to have, uh, um, you need to be working. You need to have some sort of, some of income. You know, the, the, your credit record has to be there. It has to be good. Otherwise, you're going to pay more. So you have all these sorts of parameters for you to be able to get a loan. But with DeFi, you know, they don't even know who, have to know who you are, right? You, they just simply know your wallet address. You connect via your wallet address. And you are able to transact. You could be a male, you could be female, you could be black, you could be white, you could be yellow, you could be tall, you could be short. You know, all those things don't matter as far as DeFi is concerned. Now, I'm not sure if you heard this story. There was a story whereby West Bank, I happen to be a client of West Bank, West Bank was charging more black clients than what they were charging uh, white clients. Even with insurance, you, you, you know, with the, the, they, they, they will say, that no, the risk parameters are not the same. Someone actually did um, an exercise without insurance, whereby they, 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 they had a black guy. The age, you know, was this, exactly the same. So they had a white guy and a black guy, same age, same work, and, and they, same, they work at the same job. They're doing the same work. They've got the same qualification. They stay in the same house. They, they use, you know, the same house to do this application. Um, so everything was exactly the same, 100%. Guess what? The insurance for the black guy was a lot higher than it was for the white guy. Same car, same everything. So same risk profile. But then because this guy is black, he was charged more. This actually happens to be the same with bonds, 
with any credit instrument you can think of. Decentralized finance deals with stuff like that, okay? So whether it's loans, whether it's insurance, whether it's uh, derivatives, everything you can think of, it actually exists within decentralized finance, right? Um, there's something called a certificate of deposit, which is another financial instrument, not necessarily common in South Africa, not known by a lot of people, um, but we do have a coin um, that basically works on exactly that. You buy this coin, you stake it, um, it's a certificate of deposit, right? Um, the coin the coin name is called Hex, right? They don't necessarily like it uh, for obvious reasons, but, um, you know, so we, we've got quite a lot of stuff that is happening within DeFi that is actually changing the status quo, okay? So we've got this thing that are called DEPs because you've got um, you've got a base layer and then you've got, you, you have a DEP for insurance, you have a DEP for, uh, for oracles, you have a DEP for different things but all on one blockchain, right? So, but we'll talk about this just now. So, so DeFi or decentralized finance is an umbrella term that is used for financial services on public blockchains. Very important, right? If, if it happens to be that the bank has got their own financial product and they say it's a DeFi product, it can never be a DeFi product because it will not be on a public blockchain. There will be stuff that they don't want you and I to see, but whereas on a blockchain, everything is 100% transparent, okay? Uh, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of information you can find um, within blockchains, right? So with DeFi, you can do most of the things that the banks can do. You can earn interest, you can borrow, you can lend. Think about that, right? Because if you want to lend money right now, you become Umashonisa, and you need to have a, some sort of a license with the national credit um, regulator. But you can actually go and borrow money, um, you know, in, in a very safe way on a on on a debt on a blockchain using DeFi. Okay, so so DeFi applications work on smart contracts. These are self-executing contracts that are based on code. So there's a saying in uh, uh, there's a saying in crypto, and that is the law is code, right? We don't have law in terms of um, the governing law, the Roman whatever law, whatever you know. Everything is based on code, right? So whatever the code says, that is law, right? Um, so uh, DeFi takes the the, the basic uh, premise of Bitcoin, which is digital money, and then it expands on it, right? Uh, whereby we are, we are creating an entire an entire Wall Street on the blockchain, right? That is decentralized, meaning there's no gatekeepers or anything like that. So DeFi, excuse me, guys. So DeFi has the potential to create more open, free, um, you know, and uh, and a free financial market that is accessible to everyone. As I said, you know, irrespective of gender, irrespective of age, irrespective of uh, you know nationality, you know. In fact, you could even be an AI and be able to use uh you know DeFi okay so what are smart contracts because smart contracts is what um is not available on bitcoin and it's what is available on all these other DeFi platforms right which we'll talk about so smart contracts are self-executing contracts so think of a, a credit agreement between a, 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 a west bank and maybe you the purchaser so the credit agreement will basically put all the rules that should this happen, this should happen. Should this happen, should this happen. This is what this means and so forth. So that is like your credit agreement, okay? Yeah. But then if there is a dispute mm -hmm. about interpretation or anything of the sort, guess what needs to happen? We now need to go to a third party who is an arbiter. It could be a lawyer, it could be an arbitrator, you know, and stuff like that. But within smart contracts, this is not the case. It just simply says that if you put in this much and these are the these are the these are the conditions and all these conditions are met, this is what is going to happen, right? For example, within a, a lending agreement, you will find something like if I'm putting my Bitcoin as collateral, and then um, and then I'm going to borrow USDT to go and do whatever this year to with USDT. So the interest that I'm gonna pay on that USDT is going to be based on a smart co on that smart contract right and it will you know outline for me what the requirements are you know should the price of bitcoin go down because i'm using bitcoin as collateral what happens if bitcoin goes down i get a notice to say that look you are now below 80 percent low to value ratio therefore you need to add more money or you need to 
all you need to do. Okay, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have to. Can you please mute yourself? Guys, we 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 are at the out on this call. Please mute yourself. Okay. Soft. All right. So so all the parameters on this particular contract, you know, I uh, will say if this happened, this is what is going to happen. If this happened, this is what is going to happen, right? So even if I'm not able to add my let's say the price of Bitcoin goes down. And I'm not able to add money so that my collateral is is within the in the, the stipulated requirements, right? What will happen is that that particular uh, uh, contract it will self execute, it meaning it will cancel on its own. Okay, uh, I won't be getting phone calls. I won't be. It will cancel on its own. And when it cancels, whatever the number of bitcoins, let's say I took in, I took out one thousand dollars, and my bitcoins on the platform, let's say was. Uh, three thousand dollars or two thousand dollars right but then i haven't paid the two th the, the one thousand dollar back with interest right uh but then the price of bitcoin is busy going down what that contract will do if if my if i'm supposed to bring back one thousand one hundred dollars and now the value of bitcoin is sitting on one thousand four hundred one thousand three hundred it, it's actually close to being below it will then cancel the contract and then uh, it will sell those bitcoins, and then I will get or I will get the remainder of my. So let's say my bitcoins are now worth one point four. I'm supposed to pay one point one, right? So when it executes, I will then get the balance of which it is going to be three hundred dollars worth of bitcoins because I've already got the one point one that I'm should be paying. Making sense? So this is how the smart contracts, uh, you know, basically work. Now one of the guys. Uh, whenever people are speculating as to who Satoshi Nakamoto might, Nakoto might be, Nick Zappo is one of the guys who um, they say he could be or could have contributed or could have been part of the group because this is the guy um, who invented Bitcoin that we spoke about um, earlier. And he's the one who basically came up with this concept of smart contracts, right? So he's one of the very, very instrumental guys to get us to where we are as far as cryptocurrencies are concerned. So what are the benefits of, uh, of DeFi, right? It is open, uh, meaning you don't need to apply for anything, open an account. Um, you can just simply get access by creating a wallet. Um, it is pseudonymous, as I said. Nobody knows if you're male or female, whatever. Um, the only thing is just your... Um, so there's no personal um, information that goes into, uh, you know, that, that is needed for you to participate. Um, you can just simply use your wallet, right? So it is flexible. Meaning you can you can get in and out of transactions. Um, there's no there's no restrictions, right? Um, and of course, everything is moving, you know, lightning fast, and also everything is 100 percent transparent, right? These are just some of the, the benefits of, of DeFi, right? And I think the main thing for me is the fact that it makes uh, you know the, uh, the availability of financial instruments for people somewhat. You know, one of the things that is uh, is difficult for banks right now is what is imposed by the government, which is the FICA laws, the KYC laws, depending on where you are. It's more expensive for banks to onboard a new client. So that is why banks won't go to the rural areas and open a bank account, a, a bank, a bank there, you know, uh, because of, you know, all the costs associated. Right. So there are there's over in Africa, there's. Yo, there's uh, over two, um, I forgot the number, but over 50% of the African youth population don't have access to banking. And this is where DeFi can basically come in and, and bridge the gap, right? So that, that's what I'm saying, you know, for young people, um, they need to find ways of how they can get into the space, not just buy coins, but how do you create, um, you know, uh, dApps, you know, that can be used to bridge that how do you create uh you know um, um stuff that can be used uh by people using blockchain in whatever way i mean there's quite a lot of stuff that is happening you know um so okay no i didn't talk about this so what what are some of the the popular DeFi blockchain there's actually quite a lot right now uh but the most popular is bitcoin sorry ethereum um solana cardano 
Polkadot, Avalanche, and Polygon, right? So Polygon was literally built as a second layer to Ethereum, right? And then, of course, we've got the Binance Smart Chain. So the Binance Smart Chain was, was created to be uh, a lot more faster than Ethereum um, and uh, to do a lot more transactions and all of that. But it is very similar, you know, in, in many ways, right? And it's a lot cheaper as compared to Ethereum. Now, one of the things that I want to, to, to highlight, uh, for example, with Ethereum, right? So Ethereum refers to a token, right? In fact, Ethereum refers to a platform where you can build dApps, decentralized applications, right? But then Ether is the token that is used as gas fees. Now, we as people in the cryptocurrency space, we use um, um, Ether and Ethereum interchangeably. Or oh, 99% of the time, when we're talking about Ethereum, we're talking about Ether, the token, not necessarily the platform. But the platform is Ethereum, and the token is Ether, okay? But we, we normally just, you know, um, use one word and, and, and stuff like that, right? Okay, so when you look at the, I mean, this is just a small, uh, you know, part of the ecosystem. This ecosystem, you must understand that it is growing every single day. Uh, with uh, new developers building different things and so forth. Now, all of these things that you are seeing right now, they have one or, or they have a token that represents that particular, uh, you know, debt. So, for example, for payments, right? Uh, we've got debts that are specifically designed for payments. How do you make payments easier using the Ethereum blockchain? So you've got you've got Raiden. You've got X Die Chain, you've got uh, a Groundhog, you've got Open Platform, you've got Die Card, um, you've got uh, um, the X Protocol. So you, you've got quite a, and all of these things. You can basically go to CoinGecko and you might find a token, right? Um, that's written on this particular platform. And we're going to talk about why people create tokens for every little thing, right? And then you've got those that are, are focusing on infrastructure, right? Um, that are making it easy for people to. Uh, you know, to, to build more stuff, um, you know, so you've got Connect, you've got uh, Gitcoin, you've got uh, Ethlands, you've got, there's a lot more guys than what you're seeing right now. And then you've got those that are exchanges and liquidity, right? Uniswap is one of the, um, the DEXs that is found on the Ethereum. There's quite a lot more. Um, there's Paradex, there's Banco. Uh, so, so you've got exchanges and liquidity. And then you've got cust uh, custodial services, meaning for businesses that have got um, uh, coins that they basically want to give to a particular third party to hold, or you've got uh, you know wallets that are non-custodial, meaning uh, when it comes to wallets, so we'll have a session, uh, we'll talk about the wallets right now, but this actually refers to non-custodial wallets. Okay, uh, or not non custodial services, whereby uh, we've got a, th a thing in, in crypto where it says, um, not your keys, not your coins. So your keys refer to private, to, to private, to private keys, which we'll talk about just now. And then you've got platforms for investing. Uh, you know, um, you've got uh, KYC and identity. Um, this coin here called Civic was actually built by a South African guy called uh, Vinny Lingam. He now stays in the States. Uh, but it's a digital ID um, that's based on blockchain, right? And then you've got stable coins, you've got DAI, you've got USDT, um, you've got USD, you've got Trust USD, um, you've got Terra. So you've got quite a lot of all these stable coins um, that do exist today. And then you've got dApps that are, are focusing on insurance, IX Ledger, Nexus, Mutual. And then you've got um, ones that are focusing on credit and lending, uh, you know, uh, we've got compound. Compound, you can actually go and lend your own money and any interest on your money whenever someone actually uses um, your funds. And then you've got prediction markets. Um, you've got marketplaces. Um, you, you'll have like an NFT marketplaces. So there's quite a lot that is happening within the entire you know, Ethereum ecosystem. Now, the nice thing here is that for, especially for uh, what I was saying regarding young people that they can build on this, so some of the old ecosystem like Ethereum, they will have a lot more stuff on it, but then the newer, uh, the newer ecosystems, like for example, Avalanche, right? 
um, there is now another one called uh, uh, um, Abitam, right? So you can basically find something here, right? Let's say you find a marketplace, okay? You find a marketplace that focuses on NFTs or focuses on whatever, you know, you can basically copy this, the, the very same thing, rebrand it. Um, of course, you have to be technical for you to do that and then go and build it on the new blockchain, right? So it's, it, it, it's mind blowing how it's not necessarily simple, but, but simple on the other hand, you know, how we can create these things, right? For example, we've got the Cardano ecosystem, right? Um, of course, on this particular chart, you can see that there's a lot more, uh, but you'll find that the Ethereum ecosystem is much bigger than the Cardano ecosystem. Um, so you've got lending, you've got launch pads. So launch pads is, let's say I've got, a, I've got a project. I want to create a wallet. I want to go and raise money for this wallet. I will then create, let's call, I will call the wallet Fox Wallet. I, and I want to go and raise money. I'll create a white paper to say, this is what this wallet is going to do. It's going to allow you to do A, B, C, D, and E. This is how it's going to be different from this particular wallet. And then I will go to the launch pad. I will list the project, right? And I'll list the project. The launch pad will allow me to sell my token. We'll go through one of some of these launch pads. They'll allow me to sell this token. So I raise this money and then I use this money to go and build the wallet. Some people, because of what has happened in the past, uh, where people raise money and then they, they don't go and build whatever they said they're going to build. So what, what, what some people do, they actually build the wallet first and then go and raise money and sell the token, right? Um, some will even do airdrops, they'll even do like a fair launch or stuff like that so that they can have a token um, that is going to be the native token for that particular wallet, okay? Or that, or it, it could be another launch pad. It could be a, a centralized exchange. It could be a decentralized exchange. So there's so many different things that you can do. And then you've got synthetic assets. So synthetic assets will simply be, um, you know, with the stock market, you have uh, all the businesses, for example, Tesla, right? So with the synthetic, synthetic, you can create a copy of the stock exchange that moves, you know, together with the stock exchange, but it's not the stock exchange, right? Um, so people, you are just making, you're just making accessibility a lot more easier to people uh, who don't want to do KYC, who don't want to do all those things. They just simply connect with their wallet and they can buy whatever um, token that represents a particular Tesla stock, uh, Coca-Cola stock or stuff like that. Then you've got derivatives, you've got oracles, um, you've got uh, DEX and liquidity. Um, uh, DEX simply means decentralized exchange. Um, you've got a wallet, you've got payments. So I'll talk about the two different exchanges. Um, you've got NFTs and gaming and, and a lot more, uh, you know, other uh, uh, um, things, right? So it's the same as with the, so if you can see, right, on all this ecosystem, you basically find a batches of the same thing, right? So with uh, you'll find lending in Ethereum, you'll find lending in Cardano, you'll find KYC in, uh, in Ethereum, you'll find KYC in Cardano, you'll find launch pads, you'll find launch pads, you'll find wallets, you'll find wallets, right? Um, you'll find NFTs, you'll find NFTs here as well. So that's what I'm saying. Uh, people can actually create, uh, you know, uh, find what it does not exist on a particular blockchain, but exists on another one, simply copy it and recreate it on the other side, right? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Then you've got the Solana blockchain. So this is one of the, the blockchain that is backed by a lot of money, by, by venture capitalists and so forth. Um, there's a lot of stuff that it has going for it, but it just simply went, uh, uh, it's not the first time it goes uh, for an outage, right? So the, no, no money is actually going to be lost in that outage, but it just simply shows that um, it, it, it's not yet fully reliable 1,000%. So the developers are definitely, I'm sure they're working on, on, on solving all of those things because you, you cannot have uh, an outage where you are basically in the middle of a transaction, right? So, so they're, they're basically definitely going to be working on that. So you've got wallets, uh, infrastructure, tooling. This will obviously be for developers, um, for your stable coin. You've got other apps, you've got gaming, and you've got, you know, DeFi, um, you've got stable coins, right? So almost everything you can find on all the other um, uh, uh, 
DeFi ecosystem you can find on the but because the Solana is not as old as Ethereum, you might find that there's some stuff that does not exist. For example, things like meme coins. You'll find that there's more meme coins on Ethereum than there is meme coins on Cardano or meme coins on Solana, right? Again, another opportunity. And then the Avalanche uh, ecosystem. Again, uh, it's not really, really uh, uh, new, but you know, the development has been a bit slower here as compared to others. Um, you know, uh, for example, there's uh, there's newer meme coins right now on the Avalanche ecosystem, right? Um, so, you know, of course, that's a lot of speculation, but everything you'll find there, whether it's wallet, uh, whether it's, it's, it's privacy-centric wallets, tooling for dApps, uh, NFTs, gaming, and oracles, um, DAO, which is a decentralized and autonomous organization, which is a self-governing organization. Um, so, you know, and then you also have like storage, you know, the Polygon ecosystem, exactly the same thing. Um, developers tooling, wallet, um, you know, for, for enterprise solutions, some other uh, blockchains will actually have a lot more enterprise, meaning big companies building on it. For example, Microsoft is using Ethereum, um, and I'm definitely sure that they're also exploring or have explored other blockchains as well. Um, so whether it's banking and payments, you know, uh, investment platforms, you'll find them on Polygon as well as you'll find them on other uh, places as well. The Binance Smart Chain, uh, probably by far one of the, the biggest ones as well after Ethereum. Um, I'll actually show you where to go and see which one is bigger than the other, right? Um, so the same thing, you'll have wallets, games, tooling, DeFi, you will have oracles, you'll have exchanges, you've got stable coins, yield farming, derivatives, um, cross-chain functionality. Um, so, you know, you will also find on other ecosystems that I, I didn't even mention here, um, you'll also find uh, real-world assets uh, and tokenization platforms, right? So what can you do on DeFi? I think we've already mentioned this, right? You can do loans uh, whereby you are borrowing. I mean, you are borrowing money or you could actually lend money out. Um, you could also do liquidity farming. You could do, uh, you could do uh, 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 staking. You could do farming. You could do insurance. So there's, so there's a lot of stuff that you can do within DeFi apps, right? So now before we get into... Uh, I really okay. This is too. This is quite short. So, um, so let's go into this one as well. So, guys, with DeFi, DeFi, in my view, is one of the futures of it because there's something called narratives, right? The one of the narratives that has got a long way to go is DeFi because if you look at the amount of money that is in Wall Street, amount of money that is in the world, there's an amount of money that is in DeFi. I mean, it's like a drop in the ocean. So what's going to happen typically? What's going to happen is that all, you know, there's a lot of more money that's going to come on DeFi platforms, right? But as more and more people, developers, groups of people are building interesting um, use case platforms that do attract these big money investors, you know, then we're going to see, you know, something like that happening. The reason why we have the Bitcoin ETF it was basically to allow big institution and institutional investors to, to get exposure to Bitcoin. Remember what I said about synthetics, right? So it's almost as if it's a synthetic because if you are buying a Bitcoin uh, via uh, an, um, an ETF, it just simply means that you are buying exposure to Bitcoin, but you never get to own Bitcoin. You have a, a certificate that says you own a portion of Bitcoin um, if Bitcoin goes up, your money goes up. It go, if it goes down, your money goes down. But you never really own a Bitcoin, right? You own a representation of a Bitcoin. Who gets to own the Bitcoin? The big boys in Wall Street, okay? So, now, then the next one is NFTs and the metaverse. So, there has been a lot of buzz about NFTs. And a lot of people see that the buzz has gone down. You know, the value of the NFTs have gone down. So there's been a lot of uh, activity within NFTs. We've had um, things like the board apes uh, that were popular. This is one of the board apes. 
uh, we've had uh, we've got we've had a lot of different NFTs, um, um, you know, themes that that were that were there, um, you know. But beyond all of that, what is an NFT, right? So an NFT is simply it's a digital asset. Um, it is produced and held and transferred on a blockchain um, on a blockchain whereby the ownership and the transaction history is recorded, right? So if you're buying an NFT. We know exactly who you bought it from. We might not know the person, but we'll know the wallet, right? We'll know when they bought it, how much they bought it for, and so forth, and all the previous owners, right? So think of it this way. Whenever you go to, to buy a car, right? And I'm getting ahead of myself now. When you're buying a car, one of the things you want to know is, you know, who are the previous owners? Not necessarily who, but how many previous owners? You know, did it really have a, a, what you call this... A, was it ever in an accident, right? Um, depending on where you're buying, they can tell you lies, right? Uh, but if if everything is on a blockchain, it will actually be recorded there, and there's no way to crook or to um to put false information on a blockchain, right? So it will also check things like does it have a, a full service history? Someone will say yes, but for the last two years it was being serviced somewhere in the corner by another mechanic. But now that they want to sell it, they send it to the original uh, approved uh, approved mechanic to service it or service center, you know, but it, it doesn't really have that, that. So so NFTs and blockchain technology helps with all of those things, okay? And um, so um, so NFTs, they cannot be replaced. Um, you cannot, uh, you cannot, you cannot change them. You cannot subdivide them. Right, they are exactly what they are. Right, so they are they are non fungible. So what's the difference between fungible and non fungible? Because Bitcoin, Ethereum, those are fungible tokens. Right, so fungible simply means that if I've got one Bitcoin here and one Bitcoin here, they are exactly the same thing. So if you go to Gucci and you're buying a, a pair of sneakers, you know one pair of sneaker and another pair of sneaker, they're exactly the same. So they are they are fungible, meaning they can be you know interchangeable. But non fungible is like if I draw a painting, even if at the same artist I draw again that 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 painting, it's not going to be the same, right? So that's why it's non fungible, right? There's no painter who can paint ten paintings who are going to be exactly the same. It's not possible, right? So there will be a slight change, no matter how small, there will be a slight change from one painting to the other, right? Um, so, so NFTs, on the other hand, um, you know, they cannot be changed, right? Um, you know, there's only one, you know, you might have different variations, but there's only one of one, always, okay? Uh, for example, even a dollar bill, a dollar bill or a rent or a hundred rent with another hundred rent, those are fungible. So if I take your hundred and I give another hundred rent, you wouldn't even know which one was yours to begin with, right? Because they are all the same. But with NFTs, that is actually not the case, right? So what are the use cases of, uh, of NFTs? We can create uh, digital collect co collectibles, like what we saw with the board apes um, and, and many other you know, iterations. We can also uh, use it uh, for, uh, for fine art. You can have art that actually drawn, not digital art, but art that's drawn, but then represented uh, via an NFT, right? Um, so you can have an NFT that represents that particular piece of art. Uh, if you're buying a home, we can put a title deed as an NFT. So if you get an, a, a title deed, it has all the rights, responsibilities, privileges, and everything stipulated, what you can do on that land, are there any servitudes, all of that can be put on an NFT. Right now, I've worked with uh, attorneys in South Africa, that have worked with different, uh, you know, uh, uh, royal families and so forth. Because, excuse me, all the land that's owned by kings or or or, or, or whatever, uh, uh, royal whatever, right? Those lands are on a trust. Okay, even if you buy a land from a traditional, um, uh, uh, what do they call this thing? From a traditional uh, Bandustan. Okay, there is a word that I'm looking for. Um, you know. You might have a piece of paper that says you own it, right? But, uh, you know, you actually don't really own it because even the kings themselves, right? This is something that a lot of people don't know. Even the kings themselves, right? You know, you can never own a trust. 
You know, you are you are a custodian of a trust, but you don't own the trust, right? So, in other words, uh, the biggest land owner in South Africa is the South African government, not the white people. But when you look at people, black people own less land than white people, right? But the biggest land owner is the government of South Africa because all those lands that are under tribal authority, they're actually under the government, okay? So anyway, what these guys are doing, because right now, when, when uh, oh my God, I hate time, guys. So when Zuma said, when Zuma said he actually got a bond from APSA to, to build this Ganja home, I was one of the people who said nonsense. Why? Because you cannot get a bond on a traditional, on, on a land that's owned by a traditional uh, a, a, a tribal whatever. Why? Because the, the bank should be able to repossess the land if you fail or default. But if it's owned by a kingship, you know, they cannot do that. That's why they will never issue a bond or you can take a personal loan and build on it, but not a bond, okay? Uh, because the EU don't have a title deed for them to attach their conditions or their rights on that particular title deed. But what these attorneys are doing right now, they're actually building, you buy the land, yes, of course, and then they actually put a um, an NFT that has got, you know, rights, responsibilities, and everything on it, right? Whereby now you can actually use this NFT as collateral. You can, and they've literally got MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding, with all the major banks, right? So it's a matter of time up until this thing actually goes mainstream. So um, time permitting, uh, guys, I think we'll probably uh, go into next week, right? Even though I would have loved to finish this, but there's quite a lot of information because I want to show you, because right now, here in Bryanston, you can buy a... A, 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 a tokenized real asset, a tokenized building, right? So, but we'll talk about that just right, right now, right? So, so when it comes to fractional ownership in, in assets like real estate, even things like a car, you know, let's say there's a Ferrari, it's a, it's a puro sang, it's 15 million or 20 million, but one of us, we, you know, has got the right from Ferrari to buy that particular uh, uh, car, but we, we do, that person doesn't have the 15 million. We can club together, especially those that are uh, that appreciate in value. We can club together to buy that particular car. But instead of taking that title and actually putting it onto one person's name, that title is put onto a company. And that company is called a special purpose vehicle. We then take the shares of that company, put them on the blockchain, whereby I can own a small portion of that car. You know what I'm so, so it is quite fascinating what is possible within, you know, um, uh, what we can do with NFTs and fractionalize ownership. I mean, there's a lot we can do as far as that is concerned. You can get insurance and all the rights and responsibilities instead of it being on a piece of document, it can be on an NFT, right? So you're going to see a lot of this going forward, guys, right? NFTs are not dead, you know? You're going to see a lot of this going forward. Um, you can also use... Uh, because we're going to talk about the metaverse right now, you can actually also use an NFT. You buy an NFT, and as long as you have this NFT, it gives you discounts on, on buying stuff, maybe from... Um, uh, we can actually even approach uh, uh, soccer teams, get them to sell NFTs um, as fan tokens, right? And then uh, if you have a higher tier NFT, you can then vote on what the starting lineup should be. And your vote carries more weight than the other people. So use cases, guys, are phenomenal with NFTs, right? You can buy an NFT, let's say, from Jay-Z. Whenever Jay-Z holds a concert, um, you basically get, you know, preferred seating or you get whatever that's going to come with it. So you can basically build different use cases for NFTs, right? So as I said, digital art, digital comic books, Music and music videos can be put on an NFT, um, digital trading cards. This is big in the US, whereby um, they have like uh, different cards that can sell for millions for either NBA, for people playing baseball, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, these are basically big things, right? Uh, it can also be used for, for gaming avatars. Um, you can have virtual clothing. I mean, if you know anyone who's playing games, my son, you know, loves games. 
He loves Fortnite. They're always buying what you call this thing. They call them skins, right? So those things can be NFTs, right? You can even have virtual pets. You can even have digital real estate. You know, um, actually, I'm a citizen of, uh, of another country digitally in a metaverse, right? Because the company that I'm part of uh, has got its own metaverse, whereby I'm a citizen. And guess what? I earn passive income from being a citizen of that country from all the GDP that happens within that particular country. But that's something that we're going to discuss later on. So uh, I'm going to send this video on the group. Um, it's a video that explains the metaverse. We won't have time for it. Uh, we are left with only three minutes right now. I'm not going to play this video. Um, so real world asset tokenization is... Um, is us taking different assets and putting them on the blockchain, okay? So maybe for tomorrow, we're gonna start with this. Um, and then we are, we are going to go into, uh, we're gonna go into the, the top ways to earn money. Those will be buying and holding, trading, mining, staking, affiliate marketing, ad drops, games, um, you know, play to end games, yield farming, faucets, you know? We'll talk about those things. We'll talk about the different capital markets. Um, there's a lot more that I want to change as far as this is concerned and to add on it. So there's quite a lot of stuff, guys, that we still need to um, discuss, right? We'll also need to talk about how to build a cryptocurrency portfolio, right? Uh, but I, wa I want to stop right now. Um, let me stop sharing. And 